Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'll just briefly um, outline what I'm going to do. Um, I've given a handout there which is quite a detailed backdrop to the talk that I'm giving. Sorry, I'm getting blinded by the light. I'll just move this way. That's better. Um, I'm going to show a number of slides which will give an overview of the talk I'm giving. But anybody that's actually more interested uh, in finding out, this is quite comprehensive. Now, at the end, I will stay, talk to anybody and uh, Q&A for as long as we want. So I would ask that the questions wait till the end of the talk. Um, after that, you know, feel free to... Uh, um, is the lighting okay? I turned off the, the house lights. Yeah, no, no, it's You're absolutely... Yeah, no, I'm perfect with that. Yes, thank you. Um, so that's just the practicalities. I'm going to... The, the talk will essentially take three sections. I'm going to give a brief introduction to, to Robert Briscoe's A Growing Zionist Awareness, and then I'm going to give it, uh, an account of his involvement in the 1939 mission to America. And finally, I'm going to finish up with the legacy issues that Briscoe faced in the aftermath, uh, both positive and negative, that he uh, endured in the aftermath of his um, mission. So, is, is that okay with everybody? Yeah? Okay. So, I'll just bring up the first slide for... Uh... Okay, at the beginning of the 1930s, <clears throat> like many assimilated Western Jewish uh, uh, people, Briscoe's awareness of Zionism was at the best peripheral. In his memoir, he kind of wryly makes the comment that he was otherwise engaged uh, with his duties as an Irishman. Now, that was clearly a reference to his... Uh, Sinn Féin activities and his uh, evolving uh, evolution from Sinn Féin Republican into Fianna Fáil nationalist. At the end of the at the end of the 1930s, 1938, 17th of December 1938, Ziv Jabotinsky, the leader of the New Zionist Organization, says to Briscoe, "I am still of the opinion that unless you will undertake the task of creating the delegation to America." I am very much afraid that it remained a very good plan, but nothing more. Now that's an extraordinary move in the space of seven or eight years, going from a peripheral understanding of Zionism to, in many respects, second probably within the new Zionist organization, only to uh, Jabotinsky himself. Certainly, he was at the very highest echelon of the, the Nisui, the Executive Council. That was such a rapid climb. Now we have to ask ourselves why, why that's so. Well, clearly there are a number of reasons, but the two uh, reasons my uh, research has identified is uh, one is a macro uh, reason, which is clearly one that affected Jews across the diaspora. It was as the Hitler regime, Nazi, started their process of per, uh, el, um, exclusion, persecution, and the incremental steps that would lead to the, to the extermination camps, Jews around the world couldn't help. Oftentimes, they would have had relatives in Germany, or uh, you know, if not relatives, friends. That the horror stories that started to come out of Germany affected Jews the world over. Some people chose to adopt a lower profile. Other individuals, uh, which include Robert Briscoe, stepped up to the mark and felt that something had to be done about it. It precipitated in a lot of these individuals a growing awareness of the need for a national home in Palestine for the Jewish people. The feeling was that essentially this was the only guarantee, uh, and this became even more deeply ingrained as country after country in the Western liberal democracies closed their borders and turned their back on Germany's, firstly Germany's Jews, then Austria's, and then the Czech, Czechoslovakians. This necessitated uh, a profound change in Briscoe's thinking. In 1933, Itzhak Herzog, the first chief rabbi of uh, the Irish state, who would go on to become the first chief rabbi of Palestine, then Israel, uh, approached Briscoe with a number of letters uh, that he had received from Jews in Germany. Now, these Jews in 1903 were clearly had the foresight to want to get out, as we, as we know. The vast majority of their co-religionists thought that it would be a passing fad, that it wouldn't directly affect them, that they were in Germany for centuries, that you know, a number of Jews saw the writing on the wall at the very outset. Herzog didn't quite know what to do with it. 
Briscoe in his position as a political representative was a natural person to go to. This precipitated over a seven or eight year period in Robert Briscoe's life, an extraordinarily contentious dialogue with members of his own political party, Fianna Fáil. In particular, this focus on Patrick Rutledge, the Minister for Justice, and to a, to a degree, lesser degree, Le Mas in Industry and Commerce. And uh, 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 this, this, this had a profound effect on Briscoe. He, over the course of that seven year period, my calculations that he made upwards of 300 representations to uh, the Minister of Justice for permits. He became extremely creative in trying to get around, <laughs> in trying to get around the impositions that were put on him. He tried to invent uh, different industries that weren't native to Ireland. He tried everything. He was up against, though, a set of legislation that was increasingly isolating. Ireland in both thought and practice, the 1932 and 34 Control of Manufacturers Act and the 1935 Aliens Act. These made what was already an exclusionist society ever more so. Um, of course, in the 1930s, the rationale was, you know, we need to look after our own workforce, there are no jobs. You know, we all know this, the reasons that were put out there. However, while that may have been acceptable in the early 1930s. You have to ask yourself how the same rationale could be there from 1936, 1937, 1938, when it was plain from uh, reports from Germany, which were featured in the Irish Times, the Independent, not just the political classes, but the social and cultural classes of Ireland, if they read at all, were aware of what was happening. It didn't change one jot. If anything, it became ever more exclusionist. This formed up in Briscoe's mind the absolute certainty about Palestine. However, he didn't know what to do about it. Going back to what I said at the beginning, his Zionist formation at best was peripheral. He had a, an awareness of Herzl and he had an, an awareness of the ambitions, but that was it. This led to a number of engagements that were less than fruitful. In 1935, Itzhak Herzog introduced him to the Board of Deputies of British Jews and Neville Lasky. Now this proved to be a huge disappointment for Briscoe. Over the course of a 12 month relationship he realised that the Board of Deputies were actively colluding with the British government on quotas to Palestine and, and more importantly on people entering Britain. Now it has to be acknowledged that they were working against the backdrop of the Mosleyites and the rise in British fascism. However, when he found out that, and these papers have only just been declassified in Kew Gardens in Britain, and they're quite contentious because they, they paint uh, a, a, not a good picture of the Board of Deputies in 1930. Now, to be fair, by 1940, it had changed, but certainly in the mid to late 30s, the Board of Deputies were working with Malcolm MacDonald, uh, and who uh, drafted the white paper on quotas to exclude Jews from both Britain and Palestine with the express intent of protecting the British Jews that were already there. Now, it has to be said that this was not uncommon. The American Jewry, Jews were exactly the same, you know, um, and you can go on and on uh, in that. And I suppose look after your own is, is very much a case that we can all understand. He followed on from the British, uh, the Board of Deputies, to uh, a, um, a secondary organisation that he found out, the Joint British Committee for the Reconstruction of Eastern European Jewry. Now again, because he wasn't an ideolo ideologist within Zionism, he presumed that this was a Zionist organisation. It was anything but. The raison d'etre of the um, British Committee for Reconstruction was exactly that. They wanted to reconstruct the Eastern European com commun uh, communities in place. They thought that by training them, giving them a trade, or maybe uh, a profession, that their Gentile neighbours would look more kindly on them. When Briscoe found out that it wasn't a Zionist movement, he moved rapidly on. But the one important thing that emerged out of this was that he had an awareness of the plight of 
European Jewry and Polish Jews in particular. This led in turn to a meeting in December 1937 in Hampstead in North London with the NISWI, the Executive Council of the uh, New Zionist Organization of the Revisionists. At this meeting, he met Jabotinsky for the first time, and uh, as I will just quote uh, from the minutes of that meeting, and it will illustrate the, uh, the extent that he felt that he had found somebody he could work with. We have had the pleasure of a visit from Mr. Briscoe, who spent a couple of days in London. He met the Nasi, Jabotinsky, and I have a feeling that he has gone away with the conviction that he has found a soulmate. This is a very important point in Briscoe and Jabotinsky's relationship. Briscoe could clearly see that the, uh, the revisionists as a direct action group appealed and given his own formation as a physical force revolutionary, this is the kind of thing that he could respond to. From Jabotinsky's point of view, Briscoe was like, you know, a, an elected politician in an already partitioned country and a Jew. He had access to the Taoiseach of that country who had been twice president of the League of Nations. He had campaigned against partition from 1932 in that body De Valera had and through Briscoe Jabotinsky could see instant access to uh, the leader of, at that time, the only partition country under British rule in existence. So it was a kind of a, a symbiosis there where both men could see uh, what they could gain from this relationship. Within a month of that meeting, uh, Jabotinsky visited Dublin. Now, this has been referred to by a number of scholars. Uh, it has to be said quite superficially because it, essentially they based their accounts of this on, on, on Robert Briscoe's memoir, which, if any of you are familiar with historiography, memoirs are really not to be trusted. They kind of, ah, look, let's say that they paint everybody in a very good light. It was a far more complex meeting. Out in the Jabotinsky Institute in Tel Aviv, there are detailed handwritten notes that show that Jabotinsky and Briscoe and De Valera communed individually and collectively before the meeting. It's uh, far more multi-layered than the accounts that have been given of it. Now, what has to be borne in mind that as this meeting was going on, Briscoe had at that point started to, on a daily basis, present applications for asylum to the Minister of Justice, to such a degree that Patrick Rutledge called him into his office uh, and, and dressed him down severely, and this precipitated a very contentious two-way two -way dialogue over the month of April in, in 1938. Amongst other uh, uh, demands that R Rutledge made of Briscoe was, he, and this is quite sinister, the existing Jewish community would be well advised in its own interests not to encourage any further Jewish immigration. On a personal note, he cautioned Briscoe to bear in mind your responsibilities when efforts are made to secure your support in facilitating such in, in immigration. As this was a serious, this serious confrontation. It was quite clear that, that the Fianna Fáil executive were, were not best pleased with Briscoe. Briscoe didn't take this lying down. He responded to Rutledge forcefully. I know and have always known that I am the bludgeon which would any minister can be berated with. And consequently, I am quite awake to what is correct. Nobody is more conscious of the difficulties that the government would have to face in the event of being generous in the granting of permits to aliens of my persuasion. Briscoe went on to point out after that, that the government had no problem in uh, allowing Gentile Germans in, into very senior positions in the Army School of Music, the uh, National History Museum, and he also pointed out that these were card-carrying Nazis whose first allegiance was to, as he put it, her Hitler. Now any of you that would have been at David O'Donoghue's talk recently would know exactly who, uh, who Briscoe was referring to, I mean Adolf Maher and uh, um, quite a number of others. The government denied this absolutely. They said more or less the case of these were the only people qualified to do that job. And when Briscoe pointed out that some of the most highly trained surgeons in Europe were Jews that wanted to come into the medical health service here, here it was dis they were discounted as not being relatively well qualified. So again, I'm just putting the information there. People can make up their own <laughs> people can make up their own minds based upon what I'm saying. 
Now, this came to probably one of the most personally and profoundly moving things that affected Robert Briscoe for a period of time. On the 19th of November, he received a, a three-person delegation in his doll office. Mrs. Harris, Mrs. Cowan, and... Oh, I can't see, but it was three ladies from the Dublin Jewish community. They presented him with a list of 132 children. This was 10 days after the Crystal Neck pogrom. It was a list of children that were trying to get out of Berlin, and they were requesting Robert Briscoe to go and make representations to uh, his party colleagues. Briscoe understood precisely how this was not feasible. In all my research, there's not one single evidentiary based thing that he ever managed to make a, a, an introduction to or process that application. He understood after that April meeting with Rutledge that under no circumstances would this have been looked upon with anything other than rejection. I have come across some handwritten notes that tell how profoundly affected he was by this. But he was a politician and he knew that there was no point in, in, in processing this application. Instead, he determined to make his liaison with the revisionists the way that he could help. It was the only way at this stage that he believed anybody from children to old people had any chance of survival. This brings us on to the. Uh, this brings us on to his active engagement with the revisionists. Now, one thing I want to emphasise about Robert Briscoe is that, as well as his growing Zionism, he maintained and always did maintain an absolute filial loyalty to Eamon de Valera. Now, this was centred on de Valera as much as the Fianna Fáil party. He was a staunch Fianna Fáil advocate, but his absolute loyalty was to Eamon de Valera. To such an extent that when Jabotinsky started the process in January 1938 of asking him would he lead the 1939 mission to America, he made it quite plain that in order to secure this approval, he informed the Nessie he would need a formal letter from uh, to secure the permission of my chief here, Mr. De Valera. It is quite plain that if De Valera had said, Robert, I don't want you to do this, I would suggest that this would have been a time in his life where he would have been in a terrible dilemma. Now, no one can say for sure what he would have done, but given the fact that he remained devoted to De Valera, it's quite possible that he would have had to find a different way. The, the issue was that it would have been a big leave of absence. That, that was the crux of the matter. A mission to American does is, bear remember, there was no flights backwards and forwards. It necessitate, necessitated uh, a, a, an ocean trip and, you know, communications weren't what they are now. There are no mobile phones. It was a case of a big undertaking. De Valera instantly granted this permission. Now, I'll, I'll develop this theme of De Valera and Briscoe later on in the talk. <coughs> De Valera instantly saw that, no, sorry, but before I say that, I must stress, and this will come out in an article in, in November in Irish Studies and International Affairs, De Valera, despite what every, anyone may think of him, felt an absolute loyalty towards Ireland's Jewish community. He was protective, he was at all costs trying to facilitate the well-being of the existing community. This has been distorted over the last decades by historians for whatever purposes, but often this is, this, this is without factual evidence. And again, the archives that have been released of late show again and again and again. Now I will expand on that and give you an example of that shortly. But De Valera's permission wasn't without a caveat. As an astute politician, he could instantly see the benefits 
that Briscoe Tour in America could get to highlight the issue of Irish partition. So the permission was granted as long uh, as Briscoe committed to raising Irish partition whenever he had the opportunity when he was in America. Now this was an extremely canny move by de Valera because he was facing a very strong irredentist Republican wing within his own party that had accused him of selling out in the 1937 Constitution to such a degree that there was talk of an armed coup against de Valera at this time. So he felt it necessary to counteract that by raising in a public forum, whenever possible, the injustice and the moral injustice of partition in Ireland. So much the better if we could also work for Briscoe in his Zionist endeavours. On the 17th of December, the same day as the initial slide when Jabotinsky was saying to Briscoe that the mission won't work unless you undertake it, Briscoe wrote to de Valera, I need not in this connection tell you of the urgent necessity of the work to be done. As you are fully aware of the horrible situation in which world and particular European jury finds itself today, I cannot conclude this letter without expressing to you my very sincere gratefulness for the attitude of mind which is yours in connection with this whole business. And I'm sure you understand fully the motives which animate my undertaking this work. In early December, Briscoe set sail for America, and uh, this is kind of, it would be kind of funny if it wasn't so tragic, but the instructions that basically Briscoe had from Jabotinsky, who was a proponent of the grand gesture, not so much the practical matter of politicking, he loved the grand gesture, the, the florid words, the, the, the rhetoric, and he was sublime at that. He wasn't so good at it when it came down to sort of formulating policy. This is the instruction that Briscoe, Jabotinsky gave Briscoe. He suggested that he made an emotive appeal to Roosevelt's considerable ego. He told Briscoe that when he had secured access to Roosevelt, he should kneel in the middle of the hall and make it clear that there was only one way out for Germany's Jews. To emphasize Roosevelt's centrality to that opening of Palestine's borders, Briscoe was instructed to tell the president that he was the only man capable of enforcing it. Now, that may have very well worked in, in the more theatrical areas of politics in Eastern Europe where Jabotinsky was used to dealing with. What he hadn't banked on, two things, the revisionists had ignore, effectively ignore, ignored America for the previous two decades. It was a minor consideration. Their focus was on Eastern Europe, which is quite understandable. The, the membership of the revisionists or, originated from Russia and Poland. That was the first thing that, that they were working about. The second thing that Briscoe encountered was a resistance from the Anglophile Ivy League bureaucrats of the State Department. They had no intention of allowing Briscoe to get anywhere near Roosevelt. What he had intended, and this is, this is in Briscoe's own handwritten notes in, in, Jabotinsky, uh, in the Jabotinsky Institute, he had intended to tell Roosevelt, international government support is being sought for the plan to remove one million Jews from affected areas to Palestine within two years. It is proposed that in this plan, that all German, Austrian, Sudetenland jury, amounting to approximately 600,000 souls, be included in this number of one million. It is hoped that American support for this plan will be forthcoming. Now, that was Briscoe making a more reasoned argument based on his own practical political experience. He understood that the grand emotive gesture wouldn't get him anywhere. However, as I just referred a minute ago, there was no way he was ever going to get near Briscoe, this, uh, Roosevelt. This became clear within the first week. He also encountered a huge resistance from American jury, which actually mirrored his experience with the Board of Deputies in Britain. This is not at all unsurprising. The, uh, the uh, American Jewish community was the most assimilated of the global diaspora. Many of them had distanced themselves from practicing and at best 
had a normal understanding of Jew their Jewish roots. When the support was forthcoming, it was usually focused on the incremental, cooperative and politically acceptable methodology of the World Zionist Organization. This was clear to Briscoe from the moment he arrived in America, when he recalled how the Jewish organizations in America looked on him as anti-British and believed that he was less interested in helping the Jews than embarrassing England in our hour of need. This elite cadre of American Jews, Felix Frankfurter, Stephen S. Wise, Louis Brandeis, were firmly in the Weizmann camp. They believed that by continuously asking you would get. But the Irish, you know, Briscoe in his role as a revolutionary island understood that this was just pie in the sky. There are occasions when you have to act and act directly. Even though he became a nationalist, he never abandoned that belief. One of the people that Briscoe became very close to in America was the American Jewish playwright Ben Hecht, who <laughs> who the British SIS described as a Jewish volcano who was set to erupt at any time. Now again, like Briscoe, Hecht hadn't been all that aware of his Jewish roots, but once, once the tragedy of Germany started to materialize, he became one of the founding fathers of American revisionism. He would go on to support the Hillel Cook Peter Bergman, uh, Bergman group, which was advocating a direct military attack on Britain in Palestine. His recollection of the uh, obfuscation that Briscoe faced is as follows. The opposition of Jewish authority won the day. Although we could break the conspiracy of silence in large meeting halls and in coast-to-coast -coast newspapers and magazines, we could not grab the ear of the government. The slick and respectable Jewish organizations of the United States kept this ear plugged. On this basis, uh, if anyone doubts that, uh, just recently declassified uh, documents in Kew Gardens in uh, London show that the British SIS were working closely with this elite Jewish movement to further British interests with the kind of carrot hanging out that we will, after the war, maybe sort something out. This is just a, a presse of uh, the document that I was looking at it a few weeks ago. This is a secret communique from the British Embassy in Washington to uh, Malcolm MacDonald. Do we really wish at this juncture to throw the powerful, powerful factor of the influence of American jury into the scales against us? Can we afford to do so? Now, in the event of a presidential election, and when the future is full of measureless uncertainties, I should have thought it was more necessary to conciliate American jury and enlist, and enlist their aid in combating isolationist and indeed anti-British tendencies in the United States. That was on the 13th of December, 1939. Just taking a step back seven or eight months, Briscoe was immediately aware that the political ambition of Jabotinsky to secure a meeting with Roosevelt was absolutely uh, impossible. He then faced a decision. Jabotinsky wanted him to return to London and focus on re-energizing the Nesui. Briscoe <laughs> had other thoughts. He decided unilaterally to embark upon a uh, a coast-to-coast -coast lecture tour in America, with the intention of raising the revisionist profile in America. As a politician of long-standing, which Jabotinsky wasn't, he understood that the only way a movement organically grows is to speak, and to speak continuously, and to speak loudly, and to speak as often as you possibly can. The World Zionist Organization had had a long head start. They had been doing this in America for a considerable amount of time. He had a lot of catching up to do. However, Jabotinsky wasn't best pleased with this. He uh, immediately started a, a, a contentious series of telegrams and letters to, uh, to Briscoe. This is why Briscoe, I, I'll just, just track back a second, this is Briscoe's own words about why he decided to undertake the, the, uh, the publicity tour. 
I had a conference here today with the State Department, with officials of the Near Eastern Division, and it appears to me that an organization in America is of paramount importance. Because in the discussions, it was pointed out to me several times that action could only follow representations of organizations with known large memberships. This was something that Jabotinsky didn't get. He thought that the emotive plea of the persecution of Jews would be enough to, to persuade Roosevelt. No. Politics is a practical matter. Politics left to itself would implement what is best for the political person that's in power. Emotive appeals failed the world over in the 1930s. The only things that were partially effective was political representation. This is where uh, Briscoe's dual mandate comes out. Part of his coast-to-coast -coast tour was fulfilling his pledge to De Valera. At every possible opportunity, he raised the moral injustice, not of just the British plan for Palestine, but also the existing injustice of what was happening in Ireland. He was extraordinarily clever at this. Um, he, for example, he approached William Griffin, the Irish-American founder of the New York Enquirer, which was the forerunner of the, that tabloid magazine, which discovers Elvis down in Tennessee and the Yeti up in the mountains. I can't, the National Enquirer, I think it was. But this was the forerunner of it. When he got the interview, Briscoe expressed his gratitude at being afforded the opportunity to put before you the plan for the solution of the Jewish problem, before very cleverly appealing to Griffin's Irish roots. He carried on, I have also to tell you that as an Irishman of the Jewish faith, Ireland too has to thank you for many things, and you are quite, quite right when you say that it is very important that public opinion, and especially Irish opinion in America, be kept centred on Ireland until our final goal has been reached, namely the abolition of the border which partitions our land. Now that's a very clever strategy. He was implementing, he was using within Irish America the, 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 the anti-partition to raise the Zionist, the new Zionists of opposition to, to the plan. And he was very effective at this. Uh, on one morning, he addressed the officers of the Fighting 69th Irish Regiment in New York. In that afternoon, he was in a shul going to a service and also talking to Jewish congregations. He did this for four months up and down the east and west coasts of America. This precipitated a huge displeasure in Jabotinsky, who firmly believed at this point that every Jew should abandon wherever they were, and pledge absolute allegiance to, to forming. He could not understand how Briscoe could not give everything to the Jew. What he didn't understand was that Briscoe was, by the Jew mandate, Briscoe was gaining access to places that Jabotinsky could never have dreamed about. He was getting Irish America, William Griffin, the Lord Mayor, uh, William Griffin, Bill Donovan, the forerunner of the OS, who was at that time the um, Strategic Services, who was at that time uh, in West Point. Briscoe was on first name terms with these guys. He had access that Jabotinsky could only dream about, yet Jabotinsky demanded that he came back. He did not appreciate what publicity could do for the organisation. Jabotinsky sent uh, Briscoe a letter wondering what has happened to upset the smooth working of a mission to which great hopes were attached. Yet less than a month earlier, he had been singing Briscoe's praise by <coughs> depicting as having a quality very rare among us Jews, the straight and refresh refreshing faith not yet poisoned by the dust of the ghetto. Now this is very true. Briscoe was charismatic, he was forceful, and he had an elan about him that attracted people of every religious and political persuasion. He could go from the Waldorf in New York into a small little synagogue into the corridors of power. This wasn't appreciated. One thing Jabotinsky did know, however, was that Briscoe had a considerable ego. Now, he was a senior Fianna Fáil man who had also been a senior Sinn Féin man. Who was not, it was quite right and proper that he had an ego. He was used to mixing at the highest echelons of political power. So Jabotinsky's strategy changed a little bit. This is uh, the following letter. 
what an asset your adhesion is, not only to the new Zionist organization, but to Zionism as, Zionism as a whole. Apart from your personal qualifications, which, which cannot be acquired, from the special magnetism of an extremely winsome personality to a record as a fighter for liberty unparalleled throughout jury today. Now, anyone would sort of like to get that. It would be, it would, we'd all love to be talked about like that. And Robert Briscoe is no different. However, he didn't bend to Jabotinsky's will. He continued in a series of dialogues back to, to uh, to Jabotinsky to say, no, I feel that we, we, our organization, will profit more from my time in America, raising the profile, recruiting young, vibrant Jews who could see the necessity not to go, yes, sir, please, sir, but say, yes, we want it, and if we don't get it, we will take it. And this was the beginning, this was the beginning of the revisionist movement in America. Briscoe could be single-handedly credited with taking the revisionists from a peripheral, almost unheard of organization in America, right to the core of American Zionism.